I'm Julie Hardigan, and today we're going to look at a current movement in restaurant cooking that dates back, oh, close to two million years, cooking with open fire and smoke. Now, humans have been cooking with fire since cavemen first discovered flame, and sure, you've probably enjoyed plenty of backyard barbecue over the years, but this is something entirely different and delicious a more back-to-basics, live fire, burning hearth trend in restaurant cooking that leverages high heat, smoke, and slow roasting to create incredible flavors in meat, vegetables, desserts, and even cocktails. In recent years, more and more high-end restaurants have been using wood or coal-fired ovens with open kitchens that deliver rustic, super flavorful food and an immediate feeling of fun, community, and conviviality, too. Where did this movement come from? More when we come back. How can you save time and money when you shop? Get into the habit of buying your store's store brands. You get the same quality as national brands and save at the cash register. No apps, no coupons, just money in your pocket. Give store brands a try and smile your way through the supermarket. So where did this movement come from? Chefs today prize fresh, local, natural ingredients, age-old techniques, and a return to simplicity more than ever. Partly a backlash from the fussier foams and more scientific molecular gastronomy style of cooking of recent years, as well as a world made smaller with curiosity about traditions and in international cuisines. Open fire cooking is also inspired by chefs like Francis Malman and others who brought attention to the primal and traditional gaucho or cowboy histories of cooking in places like Argentina, Peru, Brazil, and Mexico to the forefront on Netflix, in cookbooks, and through their pioneering restaurants. And there is no denying that properly charred and browned foods have incredible taste. Open fire cooking gives chefs the opportunity to play with heat and smoke in new ways and create deep flavors in dishes. Depending on the size of the flame or how long the fire has been burning, chefs can induce a slow cook or a quick char. And this often brings out and caramelizes the natural sugars in food, making grilled vegetables and fruit taste even sweeter and coaxing flavors from steak that taste out of this world. Even drinks and desserts get a kiss of fire in the form of ingredients and garnishes, smoked bourbon here or a charred cranberry there. So let's go see this in action. Today, we're going to visit a talented chef doing some seriously interesting things with open flame cooking in a 100-year-old, 400-square-foot, 30-ton coal-fired oven. Based in my hometown of Hoboken, New Jersey, Antique Bar and Bakery originally opened to bake Italian bread for local residents, including Frank Sinatra, and eventually to supply restaurants in New York City. A few years ago, chef Paul Girard and filmmaker Joe Costello heard that the spot and its legendary oven were for sale. They jumped at the chance to open a restaurant and use that amazingly unique heirloom oven to do most of their cooking. Everything from their cocktail menu to vegetable sides, dips, and desserts is touched by the flame. So, Chef Paul, thank you so much for having us here today. And I guess I just wanted to find out, did you have any experience with open flame cooking, really, before starting in an antique? Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, I, I had plenty of experience of cooking with fire, but not in this kind of capacity. You know, I've done lots of things with wood or grills or um, different sources of fuel outside, inside. I started cooking when I was 13 years old. so. Uh, 35 years in kitchens, I've worked all over the world, multiple continents, I've, I've seen it all, but the one thing that I never saw was anything like this used in a restaurant capacity. I've seen ovens like this um, in, in bakeries, obviously, this used to be a bakery for a lot of years, and, but nothing is ever this big used in a restaurant capacity. So I had to, I had to learn from scratch on how to, how to use it in that way. You've got such a beautiful, completely well-rounded menu with so many interesting dishes on it. I guess, how did you learn to work with the oven throughout the day, if you will, as the heat was building from when? Can you just like kind of walk us through a day in the life, if you will, of, of cooking in this oven and prepping for the restaurant and all the other different dishes you do, vegetable dishes too? We start very early in the morning. The bakers come in and they bake bread and bread puddings and all the pastries. So. We take it up to about 500 degrees, and then we let it sink down. We keep it at about 350, and it stays like that until we start with the food process, and then that goes into vegetables. With the vegetables, we get a lot more aggressive. We take it up to about 800 degrees, and when you look in the oven, you would think that it's, you know, it's, it's far too big, but if you look in a, a regular standard commercial kitchen, 
people have, uh, you know, the speed racks, and they're always loaded up waiting for oven space, you know, and we have the very fortunate position of never having to wait for oven space. And we put everything in at once, but we do it almost like you would do a stir fry in a wok. So we keep everything very hot and we roast it very aggressively, but things that take longer will go in first and then we break it all the way down so that uh, it's a process of putting things in and then everything comes out at the same time and we're ready for service and ready to go. So the mornings are very busy here and then the nights are very busy with service, but for service, it's actually very quick. Then it's just one-offs so where we're putting things in on, on pickups and, and taking care of it like that. But the big thing is that we cook in the furnace, which when I first got here, the uh, the baker said, you can't use this oven in a restaurant capacity. It's just, it's too hot. And what I found out was that it wasn't hot enough. Um, when I would cook steaks in the main chamber, they just didn't have that kick that I was really looking for. And I started cooking in the furnace and he said to me, you're out of your mind, you can't do that. It goes well over 2,000 degrees and you can't be reaching your hand in and out of that thing on a regular basis. And I just kind of looked at him and said, well, that's what's going to happen. That's exactly what I'm going to do. And that's what we did and that's how we cook all our steaks and our shrimp and the fish and everything goes very, very quickly at a very high heat. So uh, during service, it's, it's, it's an amazing process to watch and people are always amazed at how we just stick our hand into that fire all night long, yeah. I can definitely vouch that eating around this fire and eating in this restaurant is very fun and Paul's cooking is amazing. Something I'm here that I'm very interested in is what you do with vegetables because I think, you know, a lot of people at home have barbecued, they've charred things on the grill, maybe out back or maybe even out at restaurants. When you're making a dish, and you have meat or fish or chicken, whatever it may be, you know what you're gonna do with it. You're either gonna braise it, you're gonna grill it, you're gonna roast it. There's a, there's a finite amount of things that you can do with what chefs call the center of the plate, you know? And then you spend the rest of the day thinking about what's gonna accompany it, you know? And everything that's always accompanying it, the things that take hours of going through your brain are the vegetable, the sauce, the starch, you know, the garnish, whatever you're gonna do. So. I just, I find it very strange that people have that outlook, I mean chefs have that outlook of, of not wanting to cook vegetables like that or not wanting to focus on vegetables like that. You know, as much as we all love cooking with meats and whole animals and all that stuff, you know, vegetables play a huge part in it. What I learned back then when I had all those vegetables in New Orleans was uh, the hard roast. I, I really focused on the hard roast of things. It was fast, it was easy. Um, and it was so much more flavorful than anyone was doing because back then, this is before, you know, guys like Francis Mommen started to blow things up and really show people how far you could take food. That kind of cooking wasn't really popular in the, in the mid-90s, you know, nobody was really taking things that far. There's a, a huge amount of uh, potential and an array of different techniques that we can use with this oven that other people don't have the opportunity to do because you're stuck with a regular conventional deck oven. Yeah, just a boring flame and a boring oven and you've got like the char and the smoke and as you said, the ashes later and using so many different elements of the heat too. It's, it's funny guys, it's not even taming the flame, it's really like enjoying the flame and leveraging the flame and doing so many great beautiful things with it. So we're going to take a look now at some of the great things that Chef Paul does in the kitchen uh, with vegetable cookery. All right, so let's dig into this, Paul. Okay, cool. So this is our basic setup of how we do everything. Uh, most kitchens, like this kitchen, has a regular setup of uh, grand manger, saute, hot apps. Uh, we have added a section that we call the hot hole. So the hot hole we have, uh, is, is the actual furnace, you know, that we, that we cook in. So that's a station that is unlike any station in any other restaurant. Can I like pause you for one second? Can you just tell people what the hot hole is and how it's different from any any kitchen, any restaurant kitchen they might walk into? Yeah. So kitchens, they all have the the same stations basically. You know, there's, there's the salad station, the saute station, the hot app station. Um, you have uh, the meat station, you know, or the oven, or roast, meat roast, uh, or the fish station, but they're, they're all pretty much broken down into the same thing. Nobody has the hot hole station because nobody has the furnace of a 30-ton coal oven to cook in. So we had to create our own station for that, and that's where myself or my chef de cuisine usually stays uh, during the night and we work in here. And it's, um, it's actually the most fun station to work in. 
and it's it really is it's like putting on a show every night and it's 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 a lot of fun <laughs> thank you we just wanted to make sure everybody yeah. knew what that was <laughs> no, nobody from any other restaurant could just walk in and work mm -hmm. in the hot all right so here we have the uh the butternut squash so what we do is we put these in the oven you can definitely do this at home so you could the, the bigger and the longer it takes to roast the vegetable just put your oven a little bit lower so you can you can put these in at 300 degrees and it's not going to take a very long time so I would put a little bit of uh, olive oil. Just keep it very simple, and you can, uh, you know, you can rub them down. Just kind of, you just want a little coating of it. You don't have to get crazy. A lot of the seasoning on this isn't really going to permeate the the whole way. You're gonna you're gonna season it again afterwards, but <clears throat> always season everything all the time. You know because you you want every single ingredient to be able to stand on its own, and then when you put them together. It all comes together beautifully. So I just take them like this and they go right in. I love, by the way, that you're using flaky salt. Flaky salt, you guys, adds such a great burst of flavor. And another really cool thing, I mean, you're saving people at home from having to like peel and butcher the butternut squash before they cook it too, which is kind of awesome. And I like the, uh, the idea of keeping everything uh, very rustic. You know, you just have to be careful. I tell the cooks all the time, there is a fine line between rustic and lazy. You know, and what we do here is there's a whole thought process that's behind it. Ooh, guys, where do you see this? So, wow. So it's very simple. So after you roast it, you just peel it down, and you know it takes a couple of minutes. But again, it's not it's not one of those things where you uh, you're crossing the, that fine line between rustic and lazy. These things take time. You really have to pay attention to the ingredient. When you're doing something like this, you know, it's not like you're handing it off to somebody with a, with a peeler and putting them in a corner in the basement and saying, you know, peel me 10 cases. You know, like you have to have somebody who is looking at every single aspect of it. Is it too burnt? Is it not cooked enough? Is it too soft? Is it too mushy? Is it too al dente? Is it too crunchy? You know, and they have to really consider it. So when you're doing something like this, you're really connecting with the food. And then when you get it, it does, it looks effortless and it looks very natural and it looks relaxed. But you know, it's, it's, it's our job to, to do the work and then to make it look like that for you, you know? And you so, can see the charring and the little like slight blackening even underneath the peel, which is what's adding so much great flavor to the flesh of the butternut squash. Absolutely. It. And it's so sweet and I mean, you can smell it too bad. The folks at home can't smell it. <laughs> I know. Sorry, you can't smell this. So, and you, you can see it's still, it's still got a nice crunch, mm -hmm. still got a nice bite to it, and it breaks, and it really adds that, uh, that uh, a whole other dimension of flavor and texture and, mm -hmm. uh, and depth. Mm -hmm. I love my brown butter. Especially, <laughs> Who doesn't? Especially in the winter. Mm -hmm. You know, in the winter, it just, it, it just, uh, it's very, it's very, very comforting. And I'm always very generous. You know, it's, you, you can't have too much. You really can't. So, brown butter, I put a little bit of sea salt. And super simple, that's, that's it right here, you know? And then into the hot hole. So if you're doing this at home, you could do it in the broiler, you could right. do it in a very, very hot oven. Mm -hmm. High heat quickly is going to bring out all of those sugars and like really get the, the flavor, let the flavor develop so much better. Absolutely, yeah. Char it up. <laughs> all right, you guys, wait till you see this. It's going to be gorgeous. And by the way, I used to fight for the butternut squash with my dad when I was a little girl. So this is a favorite of mine, too. Whoa. So we char that up. And here I have some uh, hazelnuts. Very simple, we roasted with, uh, with some honey. So you don't want it to be too crunchy or too tacky. Sometimes you have nuts with honey and they just get stuck in your teeth. Mm -hmm. these, are, these are done very quickly so that doesn't happen. Uh, our house pickled chilies. So this is uh, long red chili. Uh, you can use a Fresno chili. This, this one is uh, much more similar to a cayenne. Mm -hmm. And one of the secrets is you want some of that pickle liquid on there. So this, this is done in a, a simple bread and butter style. Mm -hmm. So I do two parts vinegar, one part sugar. 
Okay. Um, and I have some other little secret ingredients in there, some herbs and spices and everything. But you guys are getting all kinds of little free, uh, free tips here, it's free it's insider very, things. Very simple bread and butter, and it takes, uh, you know, it just kind of mellows out the heat and it makes it more mm -hmm. complex and gives you a lot more edge. I love all the different flavors you have oh, going on. We've got, well, I love the crunch, right? Like we're looking for contrast and flavors when we're composing a dish too. So you've got the crunch from the hazelnuts, right. the salt on top, the finishing salt even adding crunch to it. And then you've got the tang from the sweet pickle peppers, if you will, they're hot, but in the bread and butter, they've got that sweet edge. Absolutely. Yes. And then the brown butter is so rich and nutty and delicious. And gorgeous. then you have the extra level of the, the char that adds, mm -hmm. really, really brings everything together. That is such an incredible way to use the flame, use the smoke, use the char. So, all right, thank you again so much. So you guys at home, now we're gonna take you to the studio and I'm gonna show you how to try some of Chef Paul's tricks at home. So I was so inspired by all of the creative things he was doing with vegetable dishes that I thought we would make a recipe that's kind of a knockoff of something else that he has on his menu that we didn't see, which are some delicious charred Moroccan beets. Now, Chef Paul calls them blackened beets, but what we're going to do is use the heat of your home oven to give a delicious, sweet browning to something that's very, very simple to make. So let's get started. First, we're gonna take some beets that, in case you haven't cooked with them, by the way, you just remove the stems and the leaves, and you can save the leaves and wash them. We're gonna use them to plate our salad to make it look really, really pretty. They are edible. You should scrub them a little bit to remove any outside dirt or grit. So I've got some beets here that are prepared, and our first step, just put them in a large bowl. We're gonna drizzle them with some olive oil, some salt and pepper, you should have your oven preheated to 450 degrees right now, by the way. The way we're going to do this is actually by almost double roasting the beets. So this first roast is really just to get the outsides nice and browned and charred and get some delicious flavor. We'll then peel them and put them back in the oven with a spice rub that's gonna give them amazing flavor. Once your beets are all in the pan, we're just gonna cover the pan with some foil and roast these at 450 for 45 minutes to 60 minutes. The time will vary based on the size of your beets and sometimes there's just a little variability until they're fork tender. So while our beets are roasting, we are gonna make a delicious brown butter vinaigrette. Now, if you're not browning butter at home, I wanna tell you it's such a cool little chef trick. We saw Chef Paul use it on his butternut squash. All you need to do, here I've added four tablespoons of butter on low heat to a saute pan. You just cook it for a little while until you see some of those milk solids start to brown and it gives it such a delicious, toasty, nutty, warm flavor. Brown butter is excellent on vegetables, uh, like we're gonna do for our vinaigrette for our beets, but it's also great on pasta with sage and Parmesan. So it's just a really fun, easy one for you to try to up your cooking game. Once we've browned our butter, we're gonna add it to a bowl and whisk in a little bit of red wine vinegar, which is just a classic on beets. It's got a little bit of sweetness, but enough acidity and tartness to counterbalance the butter, and there we go. Okay, so the nice thing about this, when you use brown butter in a vinaigrette, you can actually use less oil to vinegar than you normally would. I went with one to one here, so it's got great richness, but it's actually a little bit lighter, and it's going to be so delicious on top of our spice rub beets. We're going with a Moroccan spice rub, and we're gonna finish it with some goat cheese and pistachios later. So after your beets are done roasting, let them sit and cool for a little while. In the foil, this is gonna help uh, make it easier to rub the skins off. I'm wearing gloves, so I won't get beet juice on my hands. But let me give you a little peek at what these will look like when they're done. They're gorgeous. They've got beautiful charring, darkening to them, and you can even see how the skins look a little bit loosened. So again, if you don't wanna wear gloves, it does just make it easy. You just kind of give it a gentle rub like this, and the skins peel right off. You can also use an old dish towel or another trick I've done in a pinch, you can grab a piece of aluminum foil like that and just use that to rub the skins off. So now that our beets are all peeled, we are going to break them into chunks and add a delicious spice rub. Now, you can take these out of the bowl if you want and dice them and cube them, whatever you like, but since we have gloves on anyway, I really loved that rustic presentation that Chef Paul was showing us and really letting the vegetable shine. So we're just gonna gently break these into pieces. The whole point of this is so that there's more surface area for this delicious Moroccan spice rub to hit. And then we're gonna put it back in the oven under the broiler to blacken and char and give amazing flavor to this dish. 
receipts broken up. Don't need my gloves anymore. Now for our spice rub. Chef Paul does blackened beets, which is like Cajun seasoning, but what you can do at home is an easy mix of two teaspoons of coriander, two teaspoons of cumin. The combination of those two spices together is just so delicious and gives everything kind of a Moroccan flair. And this was my little trick here. I added a teaspoon of brown sugar, not to make this dish sweet. This is going to help the beets blacken under your home broiler to give them that really delicious charred, lightly sweet, toasty flavor. Now we mix these together and sprinkle them on our beets. Next. We'll just give it a little stir so they get nice and coated with all of these delicious spices and seasonings. Again, feel free to play whatever spices you have on hand. Beets can take on a lot of different flavors. They would be delicious with a lot of different seasonings. Okay, next we're gonna add a little bit of olive oil and just drizzle it over the top to help the coating stick and also to help with the browning. Okay, now we toss these to get them nice and coated. Then we are just going to put them right back in the pan they were originally roasted in. One less dish for you to have to clean. So just put the beets in the pan. And now what we're going to do is fire up the broiler on your oven. You don't need the foil on top anymore to get rid of that. You want your oven rack, the top one, as close to the broiler as it can get. You want to light up your oven's broiler to the highest heat and take the rack that's closest to it and get it as close as possible. So we're gonna pop these under the broiler for seriously like three to four minutes and they're gonna come out slightly crispy and browned and charred with amazing flavor to finish our salad. Okay, so now our beets are gorgeously charred. I want you to check this out. You see how it gets a beautiful little bit of blackening and crispness. It's gonna bring out so much more flavor in this vegetable and really enhance and bring out the flavors of the spice rub too. So don't forget, we have the spice rub on here, but we're also gonna drizzle these with our brown butter vinaigrette. Give them a little toss. And we're adding them to a platter. Remember at the beginning I was saying to save your beet greens. Why not? So many root vegetable greens are edible. And again, guys, by the way, if you're not a beet fan, don't worry. You can also use this technique for things like sweet potatoes, carrots, parsnips. Basically what we're looking to do is tame the flame and use your oven's heat to add flavor to your vegetables in a very different way. And that light charring with a spice rub tastes so delicious. This dish is best served warm, by the way, because of the brown butter vinaigrette. The butter will solidify, so if that happens when you make your vinaigrette, you can just warm it up a little bit and it'll melt and come right back. Okay, and now we are going to add some really flavorful, fun garnishes, because it's all about adding that punch of flavor on top of what we did with the charring and the spice rub. So a natural with beets is crumbled goat cheese. I love it, it's delicious. It's got that nice tangy, creamy edge to it. You could use feta cheese if you like, or even a blue cheese. Next, for some crunch, because we went with a Moroccan spice rub, I'm adding some nice crunchy pistachios. You could also do almonds, you could add walnuts, candied pecans would be really fun here. And then finally, just for that punch of flavor and a little fresh finish, I'm gonna add some sliced scallions too. So there we have it, our charred Moroccan beet salad in brown butter vinaigrette with goat cheese and pistachios. And you saw how easy that was to make at home, right? So hopefully you'll try this recipe out. And I wanna thank you so much for joining me for this episode. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel below, Store Brands USA, and I'll see you for the next episode.